So hello, my name is Kim Sauer at uh, SMT AI for Winnie TV. I'm uh, going to be hosting a panel discussion on the smart, smart Factory, and I've got a great panel with me today. I've got Mike from Panasonic, and I've got Zach from Mentor Graphics. Welcome to Welcome. the panel. So <clears throat> the Smart Factory, it's a concept that everybody's talking about. You walk over the show flo floor here, and we've been hearing about that for a number of years now as well. From your point of view, how um, realistic at the moment is that goal of the ultimate smart factory? Um, from what I can see, it's at different levels at different customers. And the ultimate goal of smart factory is to basically collect all this data and help you drive your manufacturing, improve your quality, improve your ordering process, improve purchasing, and, and basically the efficiency of your equipment, basically improve the overall manufacturing process. And from what we see now, different people have different pockets of that covered. I mean, we have some people who are using material control to order their stuff automatically and ha have the materials controlled. We have other people who are using it to improve their quality or their efficiency or this. But right now, I don't think anyone has it covered end to end, but pieces are popping up more and more often that are being used around the industry. Yeah, I think we're uh, quite a ways away from this uh, integrated lights out uh, factory that can run itself. Um, I agree that we're seeing pockets of this. Uh, when we talk about materials, uh, I was in a factory uh, last month where they were taking uh, data from the machines as far as consumption. They were sending automatic signals to a storage tower that was unloading these parts. And then they had a robot that was going around to the different lines, picking up the parts from the stock room and delivering to the lines. So. This is uh, kind of, I think, the state of the art, uh, the best you can get right now, um, at least feasibly with, uh, with current, current technology. Well, you mentioned uh, one very important aspect here. It's data, it's communication, it's data collection. Without that, you cannot achieve the smart factory goal. So that, th I know there's a huge discussion about standards going on in the industry, and we, uh, at the moment, haven't reached that um, ultimate standard either. Um, from, from your perspective as an equipment vendor, how are you um, having to adapt the way you do business, the way you work with partners to achieve that basic uh, well, prerequisite that we need to achieve the, the smart factory goal? You're right. To get to the smart factory, all the data has to be in one location, and you, ha you have to be able to get to the data and then use it effectively. Because it's not just about the placement machine, but what change on the placement machine was noticed at the AOI, and then that makes you go back and change the placement machine or it'd make that full combination. The way we're doing it right now at Panasonic is we're doing it individually with partners. As you said, there's no standard out there. So we have integration with our partners, and we, we, our partner list is always growing. So we're integrating with more people, more inspection machines, more material handling companies, and all around the industry. With the idea of that in our system, we are holding data from a lot of different sources all in one so we can actually make better decisions in the factory. But until there is a, a standard that's used across everywhere, you, it, it's going to be a lot of work on the vendors right now to make that handshake and that communication. And you're working on a standard and, and how how does the, the, the equipment side feed into that overall MES system? Right, yeah, uh, we have the open manufacturing language uh, for Mentor and uh, this is something we released last year so we've been out deploying it in factories. It's running on several hundred lines right now across the world and uh, we've been working a lot with our partners to uh, share our SDK so they have a you know an easy means to develop OML based solutions so I think this is a you know an important step to get everything kind of in one language uh, maybe not in one system but some way for them to talk independently and not to translate uh, so this is what we've been doing from our part releasing OML providing SDK to make this easier for manufacturers and equipment vendors to use this then and, and start create these smart solutions how far away do you think we are from a standard um, the IPC 217 is getting closer. I mean, they, they've got the overall language that they want to use, and they're working on the details now. How long until that's rolled out, it's hard to say. Uh, maybe a year out or so until it's a, it's a written standard. Uh, maybe, maybe faster, maybe longer, I'm not sure. But I can definitely say that there's work being done. But the problem is also there are multiple people working on many different standards. So part of, part of the problem is going to be is once there's all these standards out there, which one is really going to take on in the industry, who's going to really get behind which standards is ultimately going to drive which standards is most successful. 
Yeah, I think the, the IPC standards process is, is taking a long time. It's, it's difficult to get consensus from all of these different groups. Uh, and I think we're seeing that in the development of this standard. Now, once you have the standard developed, you also have to go implement it then. So, um, you know, what is that going to drive as far as, you know, all these vendors implementing this into their machines? And then um, for the customers, you know, are they going to have to do upgrades on machines to get these new uh, standards uh, out of the box from the machines? So I think this is going to be quite a long timeline to, to get uh, an IPC industry standard. Um, so I, I don't know if there's going to be a de facto standard, if, if OML is going to, you know, uh, get out ahead of that and, and, you know, start providing value now. It's available today. It's in use. Uh, so I think time will tell, you know, who becomes the de facto standard. But it's obviously, it's a very important topic for the industry. So as you say, an important topic and, and the basis for what we need. Now, let's look at the, um, the actual industry that's implementing smart factories or that's, that's trying to implement smart factory applications, I suppose. Um, there's the tier ones. And I think they're really uh, using it not just as a marketing message, but also they've implemented a, a, a lot of smart factory uh, tools. But how about the other tiers? Uh, if we're looking at the smart factory, how realistic is it for these guys, the smaller manufacturers, to implement it? Is it even, uh, can they afford to ever achieve what is defined as the ultimate smart factory? Well, if they can achieve the ultimate smart factory, that's just going to we'll see in time how, how far they can get. But they can definitely move down the road. I mean, they, from where they are now, I know a lot of even tier two and tier three that are using a lot more data and are help having it improve their process, improve their efficiencies and, and uh, different things, helping them with material consumptions. So I definitely have seen factories recently that you wouldn't expect in, uh, with us uh, installing turnkey lines full of not only our equipment, but all of our partners and actually turning on uh, that ability to get all the information from all the different pieces of equipment in the line and are getting benefit from that. And, and as you said, the tier ones obviously are doing it at the highest rate, but I am seeing more and more tier two, tier th even some tier three, starting to make the move towards us. It's, it's interesting, we've been working with a, a, a customer of ours, they're actually just a small prototype shop, but they've been implementing this kind of smart functionality from the very beginning. So they've started with uh, like an online NPI, a potential customer can take their design, submit it through a website, and have a DFM done uh, online without any interaction with the customer. So there is a, a broad, I think, uh, a broad array of people that are, that are pushing towards this. Um, certainly, if you have a, a home ingenious system like a Panasonic system with their partners, uh, this gets a lot easier. Uh, but uh, there's not a lot, I think, a lot of people out there in the industry that have, you know, uh, a standardized uh, set of equipment. You know, they're, they're, every time they're buying, they're looking for the best in breed, the best uh, for the capability that they need at the time. Uh, so I think things like OML, where we have this kind of general approach and the, the mentor uh, IoT manufacturing, uh, lets you connect all of these different machines, and I think that's uh, really an enabler to a lot of the smart uh, functionality and something that a company of any size can do. You know, you're not limited by uh, you know a million dollar budget to implement this stuff. So, what are you doing as individual companies, maybe to to support the smaller guys as well as the big guys in achieving their goals? And you're looking at a one line solution uh, type scenario. Um, you're looking at it from an MES system. Are, are you going out there and actively finding solutions for for these customers? Uh, yeah, we are. I mean, we, we we go into our customers and we ask, "What are your goals and what is what is your problems?" And and we have, as I said, our, our list of partners that we integrate with goes up all the time because we'll end up in in a situation where one of our uh, one of our customers says, hey, I really want to get information from this machine and this machine. And we will integrate that for them. And we, we will basically help them achieve the goal that they've set out for us. And so we are looking at much more as a consultative approach. And, and this, goes, this goes well beyond just the machine sales that we have, but actually looking at the entire process and what are you trying to achieve with this line or with your process? What is your current equipment? And how can we set it in a platform that that's going to be able to help you achieve your goals um, with the software. 
Yeah, we, we've tried to, you know, uh, now that we've, we've had OML released for a while now, we're starting to look at what do we do with this data. Um, so it's great, we can connect to these machines, we can mine all this data, but now what do you do with it? How do you make actionable, uh, actionable information from it? So we're looking now at analytics and how we can feed this data into, uh, this information into kind of these big data solutions to start finding correlations between events in production and exceptions um, to really, uh, take the thought out of, uh, out of the whole process of figuring out where my problems are, where are my bottlenecks, you know, we can feed this into these analytics systems and they can start to make these decisions and, and, and bring these problems to light for us. So I think that's the next big step for us is starting to look at analytics, how do we use this data to make actionable decisions about our production. So does that mean as companies you need to change the way or you have already changed the way you're interacting with your customers? You said you, you see yourself more as consultants now. Um, as maybe service providers, you're uh, maybe having to employ different types of people who understand analytics, uh, understand data to integrate and cooperate with other companies. Is there like a, a shift in, in the way you do business? Well, yeah, definitely a sh shift in the way we do business eh? and, and, and how we approach a customer as more being a partner than a vendor, right? I mean, if you go back 10 years ago, we, everyone was vendor selling uh, machines. Now we are truly trying to go in and sell a solution to a problem or a solution to an issue and basically um, go to that next level where, as he, as he said, that we want to do something with this data. And, and we, we are already doing that on our equipment. We have our APC function, which feeds uh, feedback from an AOI and an SPI back to the placement machine and to the screen printer to improve production. It's lights out, no, no customer needs to touch that. How do you do that more? How can you actually take, if an operator makes a change to the machine, you could track your DPMO before and after from an in-circuit test and say, guess what, that was a bad change. And send a signal to an engineer or an email to an engineer and say, guess what, the change that was made 15 minutes ago has made your DPMO go up, go, go redo that or go change that. And, and as we're starting to get to these actionable functions, we definitely see more value for our customers as, as we integrate more and more of these. And, and, and that's where we're using our customers and working with them to say, what are the features? What are, what are your problems? And what are we going to try to take this data and integrate a solution first with? Yeah, I mean, certainly uh, we've had to expand our kind of uh, our uh, focus. Um, you can't just uh, focus on individual machine interfaces now. You have to start thinking about how the whole line works, how those things work together. So I think we're seeing our resources become, our people become a lot less specialized and more generalized as we start to approach, you know, whole line problems and bottlenecks and things like this. Okay. So last question as we're approaching the end of the discussion is, um, we always talk about Smart Factory as, as the ultimate Smart Factory. Um, do you think there are levels of IQ that we'll be seeing um, in real life applications so there's different levels of smartness that will actually apply? Uh, definitely right now. I mean, because right now the big data collection is very IT based and disruptions in a server, disruptions in your network cause issues with collecting this data and reacting and over time. I think over time, the systems are going to get smarter to react to those IT disruptions and things that happen with networks more seamlessly, so these disruptions won't happen. So right now, yeah, you need to have, if you're, to do it at the ultimate level, you need to have a good IT staff, make sure your network's always running, communication's always going, but we're working on systems right now that even if there's latency, the IT, the network goes down, data's still being collected and it's going to be passed off as soon as the, uh, the network comes back up so that it, it's not going to take that same level of knowledge of the whole system to keep it up and running. And I think that that's going to be the ultimate goal. And, that, and the more we get to that, the less infrastructure a, a lower level customer or a, is going to need. And that's when it will be able to roll out easily to a, tour, a tier two or tier three level uh, customer. Yeah, I think we're seeing, you know, uh, initially our focus in a lot of this smart uh, factory operation was performance and making sure things were streamlined and, and processes could work independently. Um, and, and this uh, initially was, I guess, some, uh, 
an issue in these lower cost regions where you know they can just throw a lot of labor at, at particular problems. They can assign more inspectors. They can do things like that. But as we uh, see maybe some higher quality standards being pushed down from some of the end customers that are making these smartphones and things like that, you're seeing where these places where they typically had uh, didn't need smart functions because they could just throw people at it. Well, now they need those smart functions to enable some of this advanced quality management and things like that. So I think you're seeing a lot of different aspects that are, that are pushing uh, different uh, ranges of smart, uh, smart functions out there. Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you very much, Mike. Thank you very much, Zach. And uh, good luck with the rest of the show here also at SMTAI. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.